This episode contains adult themes and is not appropriate for all audiences. Listener discretion is advised. Kill, a true crime podcast. I am Courtney Eck. And I'm Sadie Eck. And we are reporting to you from a, basically a wind tunnel. Mm. A jet engine decided to crawl inside of a jet and record tonight epi- t- two nights episode. So please forgive the raging wind of winter swirling around me. But otherwise, we're here to talk to you about some murder. Yeah, we're excited. So, can't you tell? Say so excited voice. <laughs> I am excited. <laughs> I am too. So I'll shut up and let you take it away. We are going to talk about the La Cruces Bowling Alley Massacre. Oh, God. Yep. Welcome to... It's Monday for us. Welcome to Monday, everybody. Ooh, we're talking about you. massacres. The morning of February 10th, 1990 started out like any ordinary Saturday. 34-year-old Stephanie Sinak arrived at work with her 12-year-old daughter, Melissa Repass. Stephanie was the manager of the Las Cruces Bowl in La Cruces, New Mexico, and Melissa worked at the daycare located inside the alley. Melissa was working with her good friend, 13-year-old Amy Hauser. The two were busy getting the room ready for the day, while Stephanie got the cash from the night before ready for deposit. In the bowling alley kitchen was 30-year-old Ida Hogan, who worked as the cook, Ida normally worked the night shift, but had recently changed her schedule so she could go to bingo with her mom. (laughs) So we're talking like teenagers, little teenagers? Yes. Two teenagers and and two two women. Ugh. The bowling alley was set to open at 9 a.m., but at 8.20, two men walked into the building from an unlocked back door. At first, the women thought the men were there to clean, but then they pulled guns from their clothing and forced everyone into the manager's office. Ugh. Once inside the small room, they had them lie on their stomachs next to each other. As if this wasn't already awful enough, it was at this time that the bowling alley mechanic, 26-year-old Stephen Turan, and his two daughters, 6-year-old Paula and 2-year-old Valerie, walked into the alley. No, thank you. Stephen had just put in his two weeks' notice. He hadn't been able to find care for his girls that day and decided they could play in the alley's daycare while he worked. Oh, oh my god. The three of them were forced into the office as well. Uh, As you can imagine, I'm just a quick trigger warning. There is violence against children. The men searched the office and had Stephanie open the safe, which contained between four and five thousand dollars, and then they started to shoot. They would end up firing 25 times. Many of these shots were at close range. They then set fire to the office grabbed the money, and fled. At 8.33 a.m., only 13 minutes after they had arrived, 12-year-old Melissa, who had been shot five times, including once in the head, called 911. Uh, We're going to play that 911 call for you now. officers in route. They'll be with you just shortly. Okay. Okay. You didn't see what any of the men were wearing? No, all of our money. You didn't see what any kind of the men were wearing or anything? No. Nothing, huh? They just walked in? Uh Uh-huh. Do you know if they were black men, white men? One black man, they were both black. Two black men? Yeah. Okay. No, they 
days left. Two black male. Okay, okay. It's okay, Melissa. There's a fire, too. There's a fire? It's right on the desk. They're going to burn us up. Are the men still there? I don't know. You don't know? I don't know. They put us in the office. They put you in the office? Yes, I need a fire engine, too. Please help me. And too. Okay, Melissa. She said they locked them in the office. She doesn't know if they're still there or not. The door's open. There's a fire. It's on Amador, yeah. <laughs> Can you smell smoke, Melissa? Yes, I can see it. Okay. Can Melissa, I get the fire extinguisher? Fire department, too? Yes. She says she smells smoke. They may have lit the building on fire. No, it is on fire. It is on fire. It is. Okay, Melissa. Can I go Stand get the... by utility one. Oh, ow. Okay, Melissa, we've got them coming, hon. We've got them coming. Oh, is somebody I'm sorry, my mommy. Okay, Melissa, there's a police officer there now, okay? There is? Yes, there is. He's going to try and find you. Oh, we're in the office. Just tell me. I have 33 traffic. Oh, my God. Okay. I'm going to die. I know I'm Hold die. on, Melissa. We've got the ambulance coming. They're just down the street. Huh? She advises all seven are shot, they're injured, they're in the office. Where's the office at, Melissa? The girl's in the door, in the front desk, and then you take a right, and we're right in the field. Uh, okay. She says you go in to the first desk, take a right, and they're right there at the office. Okay, I'm giving the directions on how to get to you, to the police officers that are there. Oh, my God, please help me. We're helping you, Melissa. We've got them rolling. Okay? you got to be brave. got to be strong now. Okay. Oh, God. It's going to burn us right now. Okay. Can you see flames? Yeah. Okay. It's burning us. Okay. Oh, I got bullets in my feet. <laughs> okay. The oh. bullets in my head. You bullet the bullets in your head, too? <laughs> I hear the officers telling you to get out. Get I out. can't. There's nobody else. Was that the police officer telling yeah. you to get out? Yeah. Then get out. Okay. Okay? Ugh, what a fucking bright little kid, though. My God. I know. She's amazing. She's like so got her wits about her. Mm-hmm. She really does. When police arrived at the bowling alley, they found an absolutely horrific scene. Stephen, his six-year-old daughter, Paula, and 13-year-old Amy were dead. The others were in critical condition and were rushed to the nearest hospital. Two-year-old Valerie died shortly after arriving. Oh, God. The other three victims managed to survive. One of the first responders initially thought it was a drill. Quote, as I went into the bowling alley, I saw the little girl, the six-year-old, and that's when I realized it wasn't a mock scene. I saw that she had soiled her pants, and it was then that I realized that this wasn't a mock scene. Each victim had been shot execution style in the head, including Valerie, who was only two. Based on the bullet trajectory, whoever shot her had looked her right in the face when they did it. Holy shit. Most of the victims had been shot multiple times. Why, people... Stephen Turan was described as a good man who loved his wife, Audrey, and his daughters. He grew up with his parents and four brothers. Stephen was commander-in-chief of the Air National Guard and had graduated just two months before his murder with a Bachelor of Arts in Criminal Justice. His dream was to be a police officer. Ugh. Paula was described as your typical six-year-old, bubbly and sweet. She loved to jump rope and play two-square. She was in the second grade and insisted on wearing dresses to school. Her favorite color was fuchsia. I love her. I know. She had just lost her two front teeth. Good God, man. I know, man. This what is are you trying to cry. do to the people? To, I know. This is insane. I know. My six-year-old just lost his two front teeth. He's got no teeth. It's no. so cute. <laughs> her little sister, Valerie, loved her mom, dad, and big sister, she was described as reserved, like her father, and preferred to wear jeans and anything blue, mm. which was totally the opposite of her sister. Her favorite show was Sesame Street, and she loved to walk Paula to the bus stop for school. <laughs> oh my god. No. 
In seconds, Audrey lost her entire family. That's the craziest thing. I know, it's so sad. It's so sad. Amy Hauser was in middle school at the time of her death. She was described as incredibly smart. Her mother said that she could read at the age of two. She loved to sing and dance and had a way of wrapping everyone around her finger. After the attack, Melissa and Ida, who had been shot three times, were well enough to offer a description of the shooters, and police immediately set up roadblocks around Las Cruces and deployed search planes and helicopters. Good. Officers from the U.S. Customs Service and Border Patrol pitched in to help. The shooters, who weren't wearing masks or gloves during the attack, were described as Hispanic men with dark complexions. One was 29 or 30 years old. Five feet tall, 10 inches, weighing 170 pounds with dark wavy hair, light colored eyes, and no accent when he spoke. The other man was older, 45 or 50, five feet, seven inches tall, weighing about 140 pounds, with thinning salt and pepper hair, a dark complexion, and a slight accent when he spoke. Both of them had black eyes that were dead and no souls and snakes for tongues. Yes. Yep. Police started circulating a composite sketch of the suspects right away. Despite only being minutes behind the killers, they found no suspects in their initial search. Las Cruces was a small town in 1990 and didn't have many homicides. They had never dealt with such a big case and were overwhelmed. I can't imagine. Yeah. When first responders arrived on scene, they used fire extinguishers to put out the fire and also dragged the bodies out of the fire to safer areas. Because of this, the crime scene was destroyed, along with any DNA evidence. Oh my god, and this is 1990. There were not mass shootings in 1990, which makes me think, how the fuck have I never heard of this before? Right. But also, yeah, that's just not something that happened back then. Right. They managed to pull fingerprints from the scene, but, but that was about it. Wow. Police talked to Stephanie's brother, Steve, who had said around 8.15 a.m. he'd stopped by the bowling alley because he left his backpack in the office the previous night. When he entered the building, Steve was surprised that Stephanie had left the doors unlocked and even mentioned this to her when he grabbed his backpack. Oh, no. When Steve left, he remembered seeing two Hispanic men walking towards the front of the building. Another witness across the street from the bowling alley who was on a ladder painting a building at the time. He told police he saw two men crossing the street and running south. Police believe they fled the bowling alley in a green four-wheel drive vehicle, possibly a van. But for Steve to be that close, you know, like to skirt <laughs> disaster by just minutes yeah. is... Ter- blood yeah. curdling. Yeah. Yeah. Unbelievable. Thousands of tips poured in, but none led to any suspects in the case. It's believed the men laid low in the community for some time after the massacre, and that they had help. Authorities believed it's possible that the men then fled to Juarez, Mexico, which is only an hour south of Las Cruces. Well, it's also like one of the most dangerous places on the planet, and so they belong there. They just blunder right in. Right. Ida would spend six months in the hospital after the shooting and then went to rehab in Dallas to, quote, relearn everything. Oh, my God. Ida's husband said his wife was completely different Oof. after the shooting and the brain injuries prevented her from doing normal everyday things. Quote, I'm sure. She'd walk up to a water fountain and she couldn't turn it on. She couldn't walk up steps because her equilibrium was messed up. It took years just to get her to the point where she is now, he said. God. When there's an I survived with her in it, and I could not find it. Never fails. Never fails. I just wanted to watch it so bad. I love that show anyway. Right. You can find the season that she was in. You can find, like, every single other episode except for that one. Yes. If anybody finds it, let me know. I think I told the story about meeting that woman that was on I Survived, Mm -hmm. and... I knew enough about her story to sort of track down her name and things. And (laughs) I think it was even to the point that her episode was available, but her segment was not. (laughs) It was so (laughs) weird. (laughs) Every single other episode was available, but hers. Yeah. The universe is like, nope, you don't get to see it. You don't get to know. Years passed with no arrests. Detectives have their theories, but not enough evidence to arrest anyone. Shut up. Come on. I know. Police didn't believe this was just a robbery gone bad. If they had only been in it for the money, they would have tried to hide their identities and wouldn't have left money behind. 
it also seems very angry, very yes. aggressive, total yes. overkill, and very cold. Yes. It was also clear that someone would have to be familiar with the bowling alley to pull off these crimes. Mm-hmm. Uh, the building was in a remote area surrounded by a large parking lot. And there's aerial footage and like video of this. Mm-hmm. And it really is like this huge bowling alley building surrounded by, on all sides by parking lots. You know, it just feels super exposed when you totally. look at the pictures. So for somebody to commit a crime and then leave, and they didn't jump in a car and drive away, they ran. Right. You know, it just, anyway. Right. Also, why a bowling alley? I mean, right. you're paying like seven bucks a pop or whatever. You know, right. It's not like a major cash cow. A bar would be a better place to rob, right. in my opinion, and I, than a bowling alley. I'm pretty sure I read in some of the articles that this is like the only shooting that's happened in a bowling alley. It just yeah. doesn't happen. Like a mass shooting, I'm sure people get, you know, angry. Fights or whatever, right, I'm sure. But, right. Yeah. Eesh. It was also routine for the managers to deposit the money from the night before in the morning, rather than late at night after the bowling alley mm-hmm. closed. Right. Yeah, because the fact that there's $5,000 in there sounds like a lot of money for a bowling right. alley in 1990. And you wouldn't, that, it seems unlikely that it was a coincidence that they arrived first thing in the morning to do this. Correct. Totally. Rather than at night when you would think, you would know for sure there'd be money at the end of the night. Right, right. Yeah, yeah, there's a very good chance that there would be no money at 9 o'clock in the morning. Right. Yep, Stephanie had been getting the deposit ready for the bank when the men showed up. Mm-hmm. Ida stated that she, quote, sensed that the robbers did not have robbery as their primary motive. It was as if they, quote, were looking for something else before they went to the safe. What would they have been looking for? Ida also mentioned that some time before this incident, she and others thought that they had seen two men who looked exactly like the shooters sitting at a table at the bowling alley, just watching everyone, not bowling or playing pool. What the fuck? It's very likely that they were casing the bowling alley. But why? Why would you case a bowling alley? (laughs) I don't know. As they looked into the possible motives, their attention turned to the bowling alley owner and father, Stephanie, and grandfather to Melissa, Ronald Sinak. Ronald was living in the bowling alley at the time of the murders, but had been in Tucson, Arizona on a weekend golfing trip when the crime took place. Hmm. It was rumored he was involved in the buying and selling of cocaine. Uh oh. It was also rumored that Ron's youngest son, RJ, who worked as a bartender at the bowling alley, had a cocaine addiction and did most of his drug deals while at work. Here we go. RJ later died in 1997 from a drug overdose. Ron was known to spend his money foolishly and always, quote, out of town on business, unrelated to the bowling alley. Mm-hmm. When Ron refused to cooperate with the investigation, authorities grew suspicious. Yeah. It was his bowling alley. Right. Yep. And his kids. Right. His daughter and granddaughter were shot. His son uh, worked there. Uh, his other son was the one that came in and got the backpack and left. Okay, quick tutorial for anybody who's going to commit a crime. If your daughter and granddaughter were shot in a robbery of your business, you freak the F out when the police come. You demand that they figure it out. You, like, don't (laughs) don't resist helping. Right. Right. 101. Right. Criminals. (laughs) They began to wonder if professionals were sent to rob the bowling alley and or kill Ronald and his family to get revenge. Mm -hmm. Everyone grew even more suspicious when he decided to reopen the bowling alley only one week after the massacre. Get out of here. Yeah. I watched a documentary where they interviewed him and he was like, well, you know, the church league were banging down the doors two days after the massacre. And I just thought, well, should probably get it open sooner than later. I had to rip up some carpet. Like, really bullshit like that he is seemed, so creepy yeah he seems like a scumbag not a, yeah not i don't i don't know the guy but that's the impression you get and everybody deals with grief differently so i understand some people just want to compartmentalize and move on and pretend that things didn't happen but that plus suspicious behavior plus ref- refusing to cooperate with police equals mm-hmm. eyebrow raise at right. Iran. And in the documentary, when they asked him why he refused to cooperate, he was like, well, as soon as they turned their attention on me, it just made me mad. And I thought, well, I'm not going to help you anymore. Like, this isn't about you, you (laughs) asshole. Like, (laughs) multiple employees and tiny baby children were just murdered in your establishment. Like, yes, you turn the world over 
to exactly. solve this fucking crime. You do what you give them your light, your arms and legs, if that's what it takes. That's exactly right. And you protect your community by doing all those things and then yes. not immediately reopening your bowling alley right. where a bunch of people were just shot, including right. tiny babies. Yep. And it does make sense too that if it was if it was a hit, if it was a revenge hit, that they would be specifically just like kill the ki- kill the kids, mm-hmm. you know, kill kill, all, kill girls, and then they show up and there's multiple girls, so they're like, oh, we've got to shoot all these girls. Yep. People Ugh, just keep showing God. up. I know. Uh, Ron quickly ran into financial problems later in the year and sold the alley in a court ordered auction. Yep. A civil suit was brought against Ron for negligence. The victim's families claimed that it was his fault for leaving the back doors unlocked, which allowed the killers in. He was found not responsible, but Amy Hauser's mother claims that Ron's lawyers approached her and offered her $30,000 to stay quiet and drop the lawsuit. Wow. Ron was thoroughly investigated by law enforcement, who were unable to find any evidence that he had knowledge or involvement in the crime, or was engaged in illegal activity. It was another Hmm. dead end. Mm -hmm. And I don't doubt that the Las Cruces police department did the very best they can or could they continue, but I don't know. I feel like they, and they admitted to a lot of just being overwhelmed and right. not really prepared to deal with a crime this big. And right. so I have my doubts of just exactly what that means. You know, how thoroughly investigated was he, you know, I have questions. I'm not willing well, to personally let run off the hook. Also, based on what we know about drugs, drug cartels, drug dealers, and police forces and police officers, right. and how they sort of all rely on each other to mm-hmm. keep their businesses going, there's right. a real good chance that Ron was able to keep them at bay. And if he's mm-hmm. engaging in behavior like paying off participants in lawsuits, I mean, you know he's involved in behavior like paying off police officers. Mm-hmm. For various reasons. So regardless of whether or not Ron had something directly to do with it, or he was just trying to cover it up to keep people away from his drug business, mm-hmm. it would be, it would make a lot of sense that they would just sort of steer clear of him altogether and not go down that path and not eventually be able to find out who actually did the crime. Right. Yep. So another lead came from a Las Cruces woman named Irma. Shortly after the shooting, she contacted police and claimed to have encountered two men that matched the descriptions of the shooters. She said that they had stayed with her around the time of the massacre and provided police with details. She even took a polygraph, which was important at the time in the 90s. Mm-hmm. Know, like, police put some weight on polygraphs. Right. More so right. than they do A little now. bit more dazzled by them. Mm-hmm. After taking the polygraph, Irma recanted her statement, saying she had lied. What? And why yeah. were they staying with her? Do you know? I don't know. I don't know any of the details. I just know that she came forward and got it. told them she the was story. A bl- blip in the investigation. Yeah. She used drugs frequently and clearly wasn't a reliable witness, according to police. Mm-hmm. Like RJ, Irma died in an early age in May 2001 from an accidental overdose. 30 years have now passed, but Las Cruces police still hope to solve this case. It's It's unsolved. <laughs> It's trying to kill everybody, specifically me. Stephanie suffered long-term emotional, mental, and physical effects from her injuries. A once outgoing, adventurous woman became nearly housebound after the shooting. Can't I believe it? Yeah. She was terrified the shooters would find her and finish the job they had started. Oh my god. She suffered from terrible PTSD until her death in 1999. It's reported that she died of complications from her injuries. You're kidding me. No. Oh my god. Ida still suffers from headaches and PTSD as well. She has tried to move on with her life as best she can, but it eats her alive that the killers have not been caught. She's now a grandmother and says that her grandchildren keep her going. Melissa also struggles. She's a mother now and wants the best for her children, but she finds it hard to move through each day. Mm. After her mother died, she felt as though she'd lost her rock. Her mother was Stephanie. Mm-hmm. Stephen's wife and mother to his children, Audrey, continues to speak about the massacre. She wants justice for the family she lost. She has done her best to piece her life back together and went on to have two more children. Mm. 
A bowling alley continued to be housed inside the Las Cruces Bowl until June of 2018, when the owners of Tenpin Alley shut the doors. The building has been empty ever since. Good riddance, bowling right. alley. But we know and burn it to the ground. Seriously. As the years pass, the victims and their families are worried the public is starting to forget about the massacre and their loved ones who died that day. Anthony Turan, Stephen's brother, said he'd like Stephen, Paula, Valerie, Amy, and Stephanie to be remembered as people, not just a statistic. Quote, hey, they went to the same restaurants we went to. They played in the same parks you did. They lived and they spent time in the stores just like you did. They laughed and they cried and they were people who were part of the community. They're not a statistic. They're people that lived there who didn't deserve to be taken away like they were, he said. Today, the older suspect would be in his late 60s or early 70s. The younger suspect would be in his late 50s or early 60s. For the 30-year anniversary of the case, Las Cruces Crime Stoppers has announced a $30,000 reward for information that helps identify the men responsible for the mass shooting. Mm. Tips can be provided anonymously by calling Crime Stoppers at 1-800-222-8477. And that is the awful story of the what? Las Cruces Bowling Alley Massacre. Oh, my heart. Why mm. the... God, that's just like in a lot of unsolved cases, the details are sparse. You know, I would just wish that we had more information. What, you know, they said that by offering the $30,000 reward, which they just did this February in 2020. Wow. Wow. um, They they were starting to get like 50 and 60 tips a day. And so there's some hope that maybe something new will come of it. Right. Um, But in that documentary, I watched the detectives were just sort of like it's very cold the case is very cold and until they get more information there isn't anywhere to turn well somebody knows they always do they always somebody always knows those gentlemen's wives daughters cousins friends like plenty of people know right they're just not talking right and they said that it would take an actual monster for two men to walk in and, and murder babies and then I mean, that would alone would be, you know, that's horrific. Yeah. But for them to then afterwards to just go about their normal lives without any changes yeah, um, would be unheard of. Like they would yeah. definitely, if they have any soul inside of themselves, which is doubtful, yeah. um, they would really feel that too, to look a yeah. two-year-old in the eye and shoot her. Takes a uh, fucking special kind of monster. It's really upsetting. <laughs> Yeah. God bless America. Mm-hmm. That is some rough shit, man. Yep. I can't. And this is so morbid. And this is part of the reason I think I just stare into the abyss that is true crime nonstop forever because the horror of going through something like that, every time I'm watching a horror movie or listening to a story like that, I just think, that my first thought when something like that was happening would be like, well, there goes my life. Mm-hmm. That's it. You know, even if I survive, that that's it. I, my life is over. Yeah. Because how do you ever recover from something like that? And obviously right. you don't really. Right. It's not when I, psychologically, physically, physiologically, it's just not something your body can really recover from. And that's right. the most tragic part about it. Even the, even the survivors are plagued with this for the rest of their fucking life. And that's it's, so sad. Yeah, that's what I, mean, I appreciate them not sugarcoating it. They're not yep. trying to be. I mean, there is some of that hope, and they're doing their best. But you can tell they're just broken. They are destroyed by this, and it will never leave them. It's never going to get Ugh. like go away, or you know that. Yeah, I just yeah. I cannot imagine. No, I, I cannot imagine. My yeah. heart is so sick for them, and me too. Everybody. Live your life to the best of your ability because if you can't, that sucks. <laughs> that is tragic. Yep. Yep. We're so fortunate to be, be bopping around our daily oh lives. You know? I think about it constantly. Yeah. Wellness is the source of most of my anxiety. I say this a lot, but when I didn't have what I currently have, I've always had a pretty fucking good time in life. I've always been, managed to sort of carve out a lot of fun and inspiration for myself but say living in portland in a literal flop house like a punk rock flop house (laughs) with 
Sadie and some friends and, you know, like an actual hole in the ceiling of my bedroom and stuff. I didn't have a care in the world. I was so easy breezy. (laughs) I mean, I still had anxiety, but it was much less pronounced. And then I meet my wife and I move to our beautiful house and I, you know, sort of set these things up for myself. And it's so good that it's sort of terrifying. And I think about it a lot and I'm very, it it makes life more precious, which Mm -hmm. I appreciate because it's just so yummy that I am constantly aware of how yummy it is. And very rarely do I take it for granted. And it's also fucking terrifying because it just, things can change so quickly and you don't have any control over that. And so my anxiety is constantly like, (laughs) hello. Hey, you want to think about this some more? I'm going to take it away at any moment. I I think all the time about, you know, especially going through the election and COVID and, how yep. much it it would affect me so much less if I didn't have children. Like Yes. All of it. I can I can handle it. I can figure it out. Totally. What does this mean for my children? What does yeah. their future look like? That's that's where my anxiety lives most of the I don't know why. It's I, that it doesn't make any sense. Yeah. It's just, just And the thought of losing them. Fine. Just, right. Yeah. No, yeah. I can't I can't that's why I don't have children. We've covered yeah. this multiple times. You're all right. very aware of that and it's not about me, but <laughs> Yeah, man, yeah. I can't. I cannot. Those kids are so, they have literally the only thing that matters in the whole entire world. As much as I love my yummy house and my dog and all that mm-hmm. stuff, the only thing I care about is those kids. That's yeah. it. That's okay. all that matters, ultimately, if it comes down to it. Because they're the fucking future. And teach them the well and let them family. lead the way. <laughs> oh, so... I don't know. Does does anybody know out there? Can you call Crime Stoppers? Oh God, please, please bring some justice. Please, just one little bright thing yeah. for these poor victims' lives. Do you have like a creepy uncle, Bill, that creeping around, suddenly getting left drunk, for Mexico. Yeah, saying like really weird shit when they yeah. get drunk. Just dark black eyes, no soul. Call call Crime Stoppers. Tell them about it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and Juarez is one of those places. I, I think we've made it abundantly clear that we fucking love Mexico. I yes. got I love everything about it. I love everything about the people. I am not trying to stereotype that gorgeous nation or be fear-mongering because I'm not afraid of it. I've spent a lot of time there and I don't think that it lives up to its reputation as a super violent place with the exception of Juarez. That place mm-hmm. is pretty <laughs> I feel like yeah. it, there's a good reason for the reputation of Juarez. And so I could see how somebody coming from there would have the ability to pull off something like that Mm -hmm. because I think that there are a lot of really, really, really horrible things happen in that town. And so if that's true, right, which it may or may not be true. And again, this is not pretty likely no reflection on Mexico whatsoever, but yeah, I mean, it seems like the men based off of their accents is really all we have, but because they spoke such clear English that right. they were either you know, from the United States or spent the majority of their life here, yep. um, but probably had ties back to Mexico. Totally. And so totally. it would be easy enough for them to be here and be familiar with the area and then flee and yep. have, have a place to hide. Absolutely. And a place that's guess. known for drugs and violence. Yep. Oh, boy. Yeah, and drugs. Good job, dude. So, thanks. Was, thanks I know, for ruining I, I was ruining everything. I couldn't believe I hadn't heard about it, and it seems very, very important for the families of all of like the the surviving victims and yeah. the families of the deceased that this story doesn't get forgotten. And yep. So, if I yeah. could do any little tiny thing to put it in a few other people's ears, then here we are. I wish I could do more. A hundred percent. Yeah. A million percent. I'm really, really shocked. I've never heard of it. It's like the burger chef mm-hmm. ones. And there's so many out there that we've yeah. all heard a million times that happened around the same time. I've never, never heard of that. Never. Yep. Well, shit. Yeah, man. Where do we go from there? I don't know. Um, down to deeper down, darker places. <laughs> <laughs> What's darker than that? Um, you know, I was seeing the... Serbian film? <laughs> oh, well, I was going to say that um, we had a tiny, tiny little quarantined Thanksgiving 
of Courtney came to my house and it was she and I and my husband and my children for Thanksgiving. And then we watched uh, Us, which Courtney had seen before, but I hadn't. And I cannot yeah. stop thinking about it. If you haven't yeah. watched the movie, go watch it because it's just good. <laughs> <laughs> it is just good. It's and I really kept meaning, good. I kept wanting to talk to you about it after we saw it, but then, you know, there were tiny young children nearby. And yeah. Would be like... <laughs> so, in the scene where, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and I, I also... don't want to talk too much about it because you don't want to give anything away, but it just. Correct. Man, like, beautifully done. Incredible yeah. acting. Yeah. So scary. So, so creepy. scary. Like, some of those scenes just, I can make myself get chills thinking about it (laughs) yeah yes it's very 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 deeply upsetting it's very horror in the true sense like the the scary that doesn't come out from under your skin it just stays in there exactly Ooh, it's scary and it's not it's not in a gory way you know or like a no but just in a very deeply unsettling yes perfect sort of way well the i said this told you this review after we watched it but the after I saw it, I read everything I could find on it. I need to go back and read it again because watching the movie, it was so cool because I was re- recognizing all the symbolism and signs and things throughout mm-hmm. it. But also a lot, there's a lot of talk about the fact that maybe it just doesn't really mean anything, right. you know? Mm-hmm. And I mean, I think it does, but yeah. not, you know, we all went to see this movie. This review that I read said everybody went to see um, Get Out expecting genre or expecting a horror movie and they got allegory and everybody went to see us expecting allegory and got just a really fucking good horror movie mm-hmm. <laughs> so yeah brilliant job genius yep. go watch it Jordan if you like scary it's who knew if you don't like scary though i wouldn't recommend they watch it because it's under really any scary. circumstance yeah you can watch get out if you don't like horror it, you can watch Get Out and still get a lot from it, but yeah. Us is a it's a horror movie for horror movie lovers. Yeah, That's which very, makes me love good. it even more. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. Um, you want a couple names? We got a couple oh, names. Yes, that's what we need right now. <laughs> names. Uh, Candy Knickerbocker, baby. <laughs> uh, Candy Knickerbocker. Candy Knickerbocker. I just every day you get to go walk around town and go to Starbucks or go to the DMV. That's right. And be Candy Knickerbocker. Yep. I hope she goes by her full name all like all the time. Oh yeah. Everybody just yeah, yeah, yeah. calls them Candy Knickerbocker. <laughs> <laughs> and <laughs> Doctor Slaughter. <laughs> S L A U T E R slaughter uh, slaughter. <laughs> uh, the world wasn't is... there a story that they they were going to medical school and got married and took the name Slaughter and the sister was trying to get her to become a surgeon but she did family medicine or something. Does that ring any bells? I think so, yes, it is ringing bells go. yeah. for sure. <laughs> It's just too uh, good. Opportunity wasted, Dr. Slaughter. <laughs> it's not too late. It's no, never thank too you late. for your work, especially right now. We need doctors. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> oh, my God. I think that's all I got. Do you have any other businesses? Uh, I want to play a quick podcast promo. Heck yeah, I do. Who we got this week? Today we're going to listen to a promo from the Troubles podcast which is about the Troubles in Northern Ireland. Oh, boy. Mm-hmm. Hosted by Oshin Feeney. Speaking of amazing names. That's an amazing name. Don't even Congratulations on saying it, but also that is a really beautiful name. Yeah. I took a listen, uh, get familiar, and the guy's got an amazing voice, and it's all about the Troubles in Ireland. So <laughs> it seems really well done. So take a listen. The Troubles was a 30-year period in Northern Ireland in which multiple sides and organisations were at war with each other. There were bombings, assassinations, prison breakouts, fanatical leaders, serial killers and much more. The Troubles podcast is a non-partisan podcast which aims to tell the stories of the Troubles in a digestible way. It's narrated by me and the episodes are non-sequential so you can jump in anywhere along the way. It's the perfect podcast for people interested in historical true crime. Season 1 has already been released, and Season 2 will be released throughout 2021, 
And you can listen wherever you get your podcasts or by searching The Troubles Podcast on any social media platform. See you there. All right. All right. Um, what else we got? We got any any Patreons to shout out? We got some Patreon job? supporters. If you would like to join the shout out club, head on over there. Pay us you know you want to. some dollars. Three dollars to be exact. Or five or ten or twenty. Or whatever. Yeah, I mean, yeah. literally any amount you want. But to to get 20 more episodes as of today, as of November right 30th, second. 2020, to get 20 more episodes, you just have to pay us $3 a month. Yep. If you pay us more, you get cool shit. That's right. Uh, so thank you so much to Grace H. Okay. That's a good name. Yeah. That's a really I good love one. the name Grace. It's a beautiful name. And also H probably stands for... Hottie. Hella gorgeous. Hella gorgeous. <laughs> Grace, hella gorgeous. Uh, thank you so much to Madison H. Madison, hella gorgeous. It's nice that your family got together and decided no. to become Patreon supporters Sorry. for us. Thank you, Grace and Madison, hella gorgeous. We appreciate you. <laughs> thank you to Carrie B. Carrie B. It's probably we love you. I was thinking it's probably Carrie Bradshaw. <laughs> oh my god, <laughs> she heard about us. She heard about our humor. She heard about I our know. comedy. Couldn't, couldn't resist <laughs> the character from Sex in the City, yeah. Carrie Bradshaw. <laughs> Figured us out. <laughs> I was thinking Carrie Brownstein when you said Carrie Bradshaw <laughs> from uh, Portlandia. I forgot the name of the show. It's probably Carrie Brownstein, but it's more, more likely Carrie it's Carrie Bradshaw. <laughs> Because Courtney needs her burrito. <laughs> I just saw Laura leave too. I just oh, saw good. her pull out okay. of the driveway. We hurry. No, no, don't. No need to rush perfection. <laughs> well, luckily, <laughs> that's true. That's thank true. you, Carrie Bradshaw. By the way, yes. Uh, last but not least, thank you to Brianna W. Brianna is a beautiful name, and could be Brianna, w. could be Brianna. Covering my yep. bases. Either way, W stands for the win. The I, we're win. Cubbies. Fa- we're Cubs fans here where i live and you fly the w flag when they win and for you brianna brianna we are always flying the w that's right oh yeah thank you guys for your support we love you we love you so much instagram's been pretty fun lately it's always fun over there it's my favorite place to be so if you want to find us there it's at they will kill facebook can go fuck itself but we are on there (laughs) At They Will Kill, if that's your preferred method of social media. Find us on Parlor. Just kidding. Uh, Fuck Parlor. Uh, but you can find us on Twitter, at They Will Kill. Hey, and we have, like, more than 500 followers on Twitter right now. I'm very Jeez. proud of myself. Wow. I worked wow. hard for those. Wow. Good yes. job. Thanks. Find us on the dark web, at <laughs> kidding. We should start some account on the dark, some <laughs> Chan. We need a Chan. Hey, we already have a dick pics email. We don't need to oh, get shit. any darker than that. I checked it today, but there's no no dick pics. You guys, stop sending them to the wrong place. <laughs> Send them to the portal, and then we'll post them on the dark web at <laughs> Ten Chan. We we'll start Ten Chan. Ten Chan. <laughs> what is a Chan? What is a Chan? I don't know. Somebody oh, will tell us. I could Please. ask Ryan. Bring him in real quick. Yeah, can someone tell us what a Chan is? A channel? Probably Maybe. Channel? I'll ask. I'll, I'll figure it out. I'll get to the bottom of this. Try to think of something funny that's got Chan in it. Ch- Channelever? <laughs> <laughs> what is that? Ten Channelever on <laughs> the dark web. Also, thank you, AJ Burgess, for our music. And Oh, and you can find us at... They will kill. They will com. Kill. com and email us at they will they kill will podcast. Kill dick pat dick pics at gmail.com. Please rate, review, subscribe. Also, we need some more cupcake with the K subject lines. We also need other podcasts reviews randomly. Yeah. Kind of slow, kind of boring. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Too many jumpers. Too many jumpers. And remember. Oh shit. Um I believe the children are future. Uh, 
teach them when let them be lead the way. way. Oh my god, I watched the Dolly Parton documentary yesterday. Oh, that is pretty good. Is it didn't it? go as deep as I wanted. I mean, and by deep, I don't mean into her life. I just mean into there's a lot of her career that was sort of glossed over. I'm like, let's talk about Steel Magnolias. Nope. Mm-hmm. Let's talk about other things. But if they did that, it would be like 700 hours long. It's really true. You know? But it, it is a full blown delight. She's. Yes. Ugh. I'm so glad she's getting her comeuppance. I'm so glad she's getting her dues because she was such a kind of <clears throat> caricature when we were kids. Mm-hmm. Yeah, really made fun of. Bad. Yeah, she didn't get the respect that she deserved until about what two years ago. So, yeah. have you heard about the Dolly Parton Imagination Library? Yes, I don't... of course. Yeah, it's so sweet. She's a treasure. She's a treasure. And if you, those of you who don't know, she sends books to underprivileged children up to the age of what? Like five, I think. Yeah. So I don't even think they have to be underprivileged. I think they just have to be kids. I think anybody can just sign up if you want free (laughs) books. And she saved us. She's saving us from COVID. I know. She gave a million dollars to Vanderbilt to develop a vaccine. She's amazing. So just remember to be more like Dolly Parton if you can. Yep. Yep. Who wrote the song? I believe. I'm just kidding. She. I was gonna like. She did. <laughs> no, she wrote. I will always love you, which made me think of Whitney Houston, which brought me to that place to where we, which caused all of our <laughs> listeners to stop listening. We love you guys. We love you so much. Every day Thanks for listening. We believe the stop. Of the future. <laughs> Goodbye. 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 Goodbye.